So today let's explore these donated USB chargers. Big thanks for the donation and one has four ports, one has three ports USB-A and it says quick charge 3.0. The other one the same thing. These are European plug versions. This one has the pins at an angle which is actually the right way. This one has them straight which is the wrong way. And the marking is AC-DC adapter, the model number. The input is a universal mains voltage from 100 to 240 volts, 50 or 60 hertz. And the output is 5 volts, 3.1 amps. Shouldn't it be able to supply also 12 or 9 volts as a quick charger? Cotton, far, TN door, UEO only. Bloody hell. This really looks promising, doesn't it? This is the one with three ports. And the other one which has four ports. Each of them says 3.1 amps and this super quick charging one probably. Travel charger, the model number. The input is 110 to 240 volts. Poor Japan is excluded here. And the output is 5 volts, 3.5 amps. So let's explore this one first. Let's try to load it. And again it's just 3.5 amps at 5 volts but no other voltages. Despite this one should probably be able to do 9 and 12 volts, shouldn't it? Let's plug it in. No explosion. Let's plug in this USB tester into the fastest port. If it's not all four in parallel, of course. And detection. It really detected a lot of it, didn't it? Just 5 volts, 0 0.5 amps and 5 volts, 1.5 amps. No sign of fast charging protocols here. Some of the other parts, and it's actually it's very hard to insert into this. The ports are sort of offset from the holes, I guess. Again, the same thing in this port. I guess these are all the same. There is some blue indication LED in it. I'll try to use my test load and load it. It's not detecting any PD charger and increasing the load. One arm up, 1.5 arm ups. Shut us down. It seems it's able to supply about 1.7 amps, maybe 1.8, going up very slowly and it shuts down again. And the other ports, the same thing. Let's weigh it. 41 grams. And of course in my hand it feels completely empty. Super lightweight. Can I open it somehow? Let's cut a corner because it contains a lot of them anyway, probably. And let's pry. That's it. And the board. So let's take a closer look at it. The main is comes in here. There is a fusible resistor, or hopefully fusible, working as a fuse and also in a rash current limitation. Then it goes into the bridge rectifier. There is no interference suppression. Here's the switching chip, the snubber network with the diode, the resistor, and the capacitor connected to the primary. The main primary smoothing capacitor, the auxiliary capacitor for the low voltage for the chip on the primary side. Rectified using this diode going from the auxiliary winding. Couple more resistors in the divider, sensing the voltage. Because there is no optocoupler, it actually senses the voltage on the primary side. And having no optocoupler, there is no way the secondary side could tell the primary side to increase the duty cycle and increase the voltage. And there is also no chip on the secondary side to communicate with the device. So obviously this could never switch its voltages. It's just 5 volts. It was never meant to supply any other voltage. And the data pins are probably just connected with each other on these ports. And of course all the four ports are connected in parallel. On one negative rail and one positive rail. When the maximum for one port is 1.8 amps, it also means the total current for all ports is 1.8 amps maximum. And here is some loading resistor, discharging resistor for the capacitor. Or maybe the resistor of this LED. More likely it's the resistor for the LED actually. There is not even any discharging resistor for this secondary capacitor, which also is quite tiny. The footprint on the board is much bigger. This is just 680 micro and it's just 10 volts, which again shows it was never meant for 12 volts. And here's the rectification diode on the secondary side, which is just a normal diode, which is of course lossier than a synchronous rectifier, which is used in modern chargers. And the interference capacitor, that's the only interference suppression. This capacitor between the primary and the secondary side of course it's not a safety capacitor, it's just an ordinary 1 kV capacitor, 2.2 nano. And if this one fails short circuit, the mains voltage gets to the output and gives you a shock. That's why in this position you should have a safety Y capacitor, class Y1 ideally. And of course the isolation distance isn't up to a European standard. 
the distance between the primary side traces and the secondary side traces is too small. It's slightly under two millimeters. Of course, there is absolutely no difference between this part and the other three parts. And marking of the primary chip and the data sheet with notes that I can read it. Some example schematic here. And the version in this charger is 33B, intended for 5 volts 2 amps. It can't even do this. Let's leave it running for a while, as the maximum current it can supply. It still works after 4 hours. And of course some thermal imaging. 73 degree, this side is hot. This is always a brilliant idea, isn't it? The diode is the hottest. One hundred degrees under the diode, and the chip is one hundred three degrees Celsius. But now, of course, let's dissolve the transformer to make an autopsy of it. Of course, we have to open the ferrite core using a melted hair dryer. Of course, the halves of the ferrite core are separated now. It was a flyback switching power supply, so it had an air gap in the middle. And now let's take a look at the windings. Some insulation tape on the top, two layers, and probably the auxiliary winding, which is of course connected with the primary side, the main side, and here it's quite close to the secondary, which is connected with the output. The insulation is a bit molten here, the winding is getting very close, and it would probably get even more molten if it was running for longer. This is the worst spot. Here it's getting super close. The tiny gap between this wire and this winding is basically the gap between the minus voltage and U, between the user and the death, by electrocution. And that's about how the makers care about the life of the customer, and let's remove the auxiliary winding. And here's the insulation under it, which is sort of kind of molten, partially. Let's remove the insulation, one layer, two layers. Then the secondary made of two parallel wires here. And the terminals here. And the secondary winding extremely close to the ends of the primary winding. These thin wires are connected to the main side, and this is connected to the user, basically. So if the voltage arcs over the tiny gap or the wires touch and the super thin locker on the wire fails, you get minus voltage at the output end, basically in your phone or device. I took the secondary winding off. The insulation under it isn't that bad, but it was horrible in other spots, near the terminals of the primary and also near the auxiliary winding. And the last winding, of course, is the primary here. At least the windings don't seem to be aluminium. But let's sum it up. It can only supply half of the current it claims. The insulation distance between the primary and secondary side isn't sufficient. The capacitor between the primary and secondary side isn't a safety type. If it fails, the user can be electrocuted. And for the maker, it still wasn't worth putting a safety capacitor in it. The isolation in the transformer is horrible. There's virtually no interference suppression. And it's definitely not a 3.0 quick charger. So the conclusion is... Dodgy! And now let's test the next one. No worries, I'm only UE owing it for the end door. So I can plug it in. It's plugged in. Is it another of these with the display on it? So let's explore it. Let's plug it in this way so I can plug this one into it. It supplies 5.1 volts. Now of course trying to load it. Increasing the load. 1.8 amps, 1.9, 2 amps, and it shuts down. Let's leave it running for some time near the maximum current. No failure after 8 hours. On the outside it's actually significantly less hot than the other one. And the other side of it, well this one is a bit hotter, 68 degrees Celsius. But if I unwrap it, it's actually hotter now. Not much difference, actually. This one might be similar to something I was already opening, or even the same. 40 grams, but now let's see the internals. Is it the same or not? Of course, I've opened so many that I might not even remember. And 
appears the internals. The cassette again contains this voltmeter, which just shows 5.2 volts all the time. It's not an actual voltmeter, it's just hardwired. You can see the three ports. And there is actually some communication chip here, or at least a chip telling the load how much current it can draw. Can it actually change the voltages? I don't see any optocoupler here, so I guess it can't change voltages. It's quite similar to the previous one, but there are some differences. It's actually using a synchronous rectifier chip here, instead of the normal diode or Schottky diode, which of course has much more heat loss than this synchronous rectifier, with basically a synchronous switching MOSFET, dropping significantly less voltage. This chip isn't in the other one end, also the voltmeter. But it again has just a 10 volt capacitor, so it definitely can't do 12 volts. Let's put it back together and let's try to detect what charging modes it can support. This actually seems the same as the first one, but of course having no optocoupler in it, it can't change the voltages and this chip is just to make it compatible with some devices to indicate how much current it can supply, but it doesn't have the 9 or 12 volt modes. There's again a non-safety capacitor instead of Y1. The board actually says it, but it's just a 2.2 nano one kilovolt capacitor, a non-safety capacitor in a safety critical application, just like in the first one. So let's desolder the transformer. Is there going to be any difference? Just very quickly, because it might be very similar or identical. Here's the auxiliary. The initialization under it may be slightly less molten here. Here's the secondary. Let's remove it. Here the insulation under it, and I guess the synchronous rectifier actually helps to reduce the losses inside of it and reduce the temperature in the box. Here's the secondary, which is the same construction as in the other one, two parallel wires, and here the secondary is very close to the ends of the primary. It's almost touching here. This spot and this spot is really concerning. Just about no distance in between of these. These are millimeters. Removed the secondary and it's again a copper, what a luxury, isn't it? And the insulation under it is nice, but it doesn't really help when the ends of the primary are exposed here. One layer, two layers, and the primary. The transformer is basically identical, other than the distances between the windings randomly differ based on how they wind it. Let's just demonstrate the fake voltmeter connecting it to my bench power supply. And as I change the voltage, the reading doesn't change, it just changes its brightness. And there's a space on the board for a second secondary capacitor in parallel to this one, but of course they didn't put any here. And the isolation distance on the board is actually slightly better in this one, but it still could be bigger. The synchronous rectifier here is a nice bonus. Not sure if I should call the fake voltmeter a bonus, but it still can supply just 2 amps, not 3.1 as it says. This capacitor is not a safety capacitor and the insulation in the transformer was horrible. So the conclusion is... Dodgy! So that's it. Beware of these electrocution interference generators. And if you like my videos, please consider subscribing, supporting my channel on Patreon or using the thanks button. And big thanks to all of you who already support me and keep this channel running. And also thanks for donating interesting subjects for the videos.